Thanks, uh, thanks for staying with us. We're going to talk about trade, and uh, I'm going to try to, uh, to make it an uplifting session. I think uh, I'm a long-term optimist on trade. Someone asked me the other day, he said, you know, it must be a great time to be an economist and to be in the field of trade. And I said, it really isn't. It's, um, it's like being a high school physics teacher and having to teach a class about gravity every day over and over. And uh, you want to talk about nuclear physics and all this other stuff, but every day you're being asked to talk about gravity, and it gets worse. Sometimes someone comes to your classroom and says, you know, gravity, I'm not convinced. Uh, so trade is good. Uh, more trade is better. Uh, in a globally integrated economy, bilateral trade deficits don't matter, and trade tariffs do nothing to address bilateral trade deficits. Those are facts, like gravity. Um, like I said, I'm a long-term optimist about trade. The world has been on a decades-long trend towards more and more rule-based trade. Uh, that trend is being disrupted right now by a major global economic actor, the U.S. Uh, the current administration has concluded that the gains from trade are not sufficiently accruing to the U.S. consumer, and it has a variety of strategies in place to address that. Uh, as a result, we have a stalemate at the WTO, we have no meaningful transatlantic trade dialogue, and we have significant uh, trade tensions between um, the U.S. and China. And I'm, I'm from a small European country, so I know what the difference is between being a player on the chessboard and being a piece on the chessboard. And when the U.S. and China have uh, economic disagreements, the fallout in a world of globally integrated supply chains is, is wide and vast and massively disruptive, uh, including in energy markets. Um, I have, I have a great panel. Uh, I, I couldn't be more excited. Uh, we have uh, senior private and public sector representatives. I'm going to introduce them one by one. I hope you'll join me in welcoming them. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Mr. Han Wenke. Uh, he's a senior research fellow at the NRDC, uh, NDRC in, in China. For those of you familiar with China, the NDRC runs the economy. Uh, please welcome. Uh, my second panelist is Dr. Yongsung Cho. He's the president of the Korea Energy Economic Institute. Please welcome. And then we were joined by Dr. Uh, Carol Nachle, uh, the CEO and founder of Crystal Energy. Welcome, Carol. And then we have the, the pleasure of having Dr. Arunaba Ghosh, the founder and CEO of the Council on Energy, Environment, and Water, a leading uh, think tank in India. And last but not least, we're joined by Michael Train, the president of Emerson. Welcome, Michael. Mr. Han, my first question is for you. Uh, as a, a senior uh, policymaker in, in China, you have a front row seat to these trade tensions and trade dialogue. Uh, how are the negotiations faring? I know we're, we're stumbling from ceasefire to ceasefire, uh, it, it seems from my perspective. Uh, how have they affected uh, Chinese consumers, energy policy, business, and, 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 and the like? Uh, uh, when we talk about uh, uh, China-U.S. Uh, trade relations, uh, we, uh, you look at the China-U.S. Uh, relations out of China. Uh, I say it uh, in China, so we maybe have some uh, little different feelings. Uh, 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 in general, uh, I think uh, uh, the tension to the relations uh, have a, a little, a very lighter impact on China's economic growth, economic uh, and uh, energy sectors. Uh, uh, we realize that China's economy have uh, our self issues, uh, uh, unbalance. The unbalance means the uh, sectors, uh, between sectors and the region to regions, and uh, something. Uh, uh, because the China uh, economy grows fast, the next decades, uh, so something 
uh, we consult the uh, at that time. Uh, so, but uh, in the past years, uh, uh, I mean, 2019, the China's economy uh, uh, goes the just very lower than uh, 2018. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing is uh, the consumer uh, uh, consumption is very strong. And uh, some stock market maybe have some benefit return. Uh, but uh, the issues is uh, some, some areas, some uh, provinces, some cities, they mainly depend on the uh, export the goods, export uh, some, uh, some things. Uh, where they uh, rely the imports to the US, they have a bigger trouble. But he, uh, they make a shift. Uh, they, uh, the government encourages the uh, business shift to the out of China, shift, shift to the other places. Uh, this is something. But I think this is better things. Uh, this is the balance, rebalance uh, process. Uh, uh, for the business, uh, uh, we can see some uh, companies uh, uh, run the business very good. Some companies run business very, very difficult. Uh, the different, very, very different. Uh, uh, these things not happened in the China before. Uh, uh, in the energy sectors, uh, bec uh, we, because China's uh, energy consumption came from the mainly came from the China uh, produces, uh, uh, I, I mean, so produces in domestic. Uh, mm -hmm. So the uh, energy sectors just uh, face the. Uh, uh, light impact, uh, uh, but uh, I, I think uh, we cost a lot for the energy security. Uh, the, the government have some uh, measures, uh, set some measures, uh, ensure the energy security, uh, they raise the, the, the cost. Uh, uh, this uh, things. So the China's companies and uh, me, uh, we want uh, uh, we we want to see the U.S. and the China uh, ceasefire, uh, 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 sign the agreement, uh, uh, and uh, we want to import uh, much uh, more uh, U.S. LNG, US oil, and uh, have uh, uh, some corporations. Uh, uh, they, this is about <laughs> the China US trade relations. Okay. Thank I, you. I that's think it's a great, uh, great way to get us started. Let's talk a little bit both about India and Korea, uh, but significant energy importers. Uh, Jungsun, can we start with you? Uh, Korea is an energy importer in the midst of greening its supply. Um, mm. How are these trade tensions that you are a witness to right now, how are they affecting prices, uh, consumers, policy making? Uh, I'm glad to be here. Um, thanks to Atlantic Council to invite me to uh, this place. Actually, uh, I don't know how many people uh, understand the economy of South Korea. South Korea has an export-oriented economy. More than 50% of GDP came from the export and 25% of total export uh, belong to China, and another 12% of total export 
belong to USA. That means one third of total export of South Korea belong to China and Korea. Uh, trade war reminded me of one sentence. I tried to find a very proper word. Innocent bystander get hurt in a fight. Right now it's the same situation to South Korea. We checked uh, the effect of trade war. The Korean export decreased by 10% in 2019, last year, which is the largest drop since 2009, at the time we have global finance crisis. Some experts say uh, that kind of largest drop result from not only uh, trade war, but also China economic slowdown. For the uh, energy sector, uh, for example, solar PV, actually Korean uh, solar PV export decreased by 4.8% last year. But we found very interesting uh, positive side event uh, effect of trade war. That is uh, something like change in energy market, the price and the volume. In 2017, we import uh, about 38 million ton of LNG from the all around. And then among them, uh, 5%, uh, which means 2 million ton from the USA. Two years later, last year, 2019, our volume of total LNG import is very similar to two years ago. But the amount of LNG import from the USA increased 150%. And also another interesting one is uh, the China is a totally diverse case. The China, they import lots of LNG uh, during the two years from the 2017 <coughs> to 2019, but the portion of uh, LNG from the USA is decreasing. So, and also we analyzing to the uh, spot market, the price change. One interesting uh, we found is, it's just for Korean case, the average price of uh, LNG spot uh, market price is 6.8 US dollar per MMBTU. That was uh, 2017, two years ago. But that price goes down to 6 US dollar last year. Especially in the uh, summertime, Summertime is off season in terms of LNG because summertime. So in 2017, the price of July in LNG spot market, the price is 5.3 US dollar. That goes down to 4.7 in 2019 last year. So it's an interesting one. So that means there is both side of the impact of the trade war, but still like as South Korea, uh, oriented by export economy, we have big uh, impact. Okay. Yeah. That's Thank cool. you. It, I, it, this is a, a great reminder that you know, while a global rule rule based system is a global public good, uh, and trade tensions aren't uh, good for anybody, there are short term winners and losers. And I, I'm going to ask both Carol and Michael to, to comment on that later. Arnab, right, can we talk about India? We are significant energy importer. Uh, 80% of oil is imported. Your, your energy trade with the U.S. alone is 10 billion annually. Uh, what are some of the impacts that you have been seeing? Thanks, Bart, and uh, thanks to the Atlantic Council for inviting me here. Um, India is a, about, give or take, 2.7, 2.8 trillion dollar economy. It wants to become a 5 trillion dollar economy by about 2024. But unlike other emerging economies or now advanced economies of Asia, it is still a relatively insular economy. So the trade GDP ratio has been about 40% creeping up to 41, 42, 43% last year. Um, that's very different from China, very different from the Korea profile. So when you have a trade war um, or a number, I would call it a series of skirmishes between, um, between trading partners, the major trading partners, if you're relatively insular, you don't immediately benefit. You know, there's a lot of commentary, ah, you know, if the US is raising, raising tariffs against China, this is our moment, but it doesn't happen. You know, you can't just turn on and turn off a switch. Um, so the issue here then is, what is the consequence of the trade war or trade-related uncertainty, both in rules as well as in actual flows, for 
other economies, so other major economies. And it's that uncertainty that increases or, reduces, uh, or, or, or uh, decreases overall energy demand and so forth. Which, may, which brings me to the specific point you asked. Um, one issue that India has been continuing to grapple with is uncertainty over um, the oil import bill. Um, and if, when you are importing you know, uh, more than 80, 81 percent of your uh, crude oil uh, needs, then whatever is happening in global energy markets is going to matter. So over the last five years, India has spent anywhere between $60 billion and $120 billion, $125 billion for about the same amount of oil. I mean, again, you know, it will increase a little bit. But you see the range. So if I, if I were a Ministry of Finance budgeting expert, I would, be I would manage to put in no expertise into figuring out how do you plan for a government budget when you have 100% variability in the potential oil import bill. So that remains a major concern, uh, which then, of course, an energy price is, uh, for, uh, for Indian industry is, as a, as, a, as a relative to input costs, is much higher than for other um, emerging or advanced economies. So that variability in energy price affects your competitiveness. The third way in which this is um, working out is who is going to supply the energy to me. Um, so before the Iran deal, um, you had Saudi Arabia, Iraq, uh, and then maybe in Nigeria, Venezuela as kind of primary suppliers. After the Iran deal, Iran again came up to becoming within the top three suppliers. And then again, it slipped back down. But guess what's happened in the meantime? 2017, we imported U.S. crude for the first time. And U.S. has already gone up by November 2019, becoming the sixth largest uh, supplier of crude to India. Uh, it's still just 5% compared to, say, 20% from Iraq and 18% from Saudi. But you're seeing a major shift in the, in the suppliers. So from a trade and an energy perspective, the issues that continue to remain uncertain is how quickly can you uh, turn that switch on and off uh, in terms of grabbing the opportunities that arise versus deal with the uncertainties in the overall global trading regime. Second, how do you budget for, as a company or as a country, for huge variability in crude oil prices? And third, how do you secure yourself when your suppliers are changing um, quite frequently year on year? Okay, excellent. Uh, and I'm going to pick up on a number of those points because I think sure. the, the, the opportunities and challenges for both the public and the private sector, given these uncertainties that, sure. you, uh, that you highlight, are, are important to come back to. Carol, can we talk uh, a bit about energy prices, uh, your view on how this uncertainty has, has affected them? And let's, let's come back to the point about short-term opportunities and challenges for, for other actors and who's, who's winning in this trade war, please. <laughs> You know, for trade wars, some people say that they bring winners and losers, but let me um, look at this issue from a volume dimension and a price dimension. So if you look at in terms of volume, so let's talk about uh, the barrels of oil that have been going from the U.S. to China. Actually, both oil and LNG, uh, I think they both reached a peak in October 2017. And uh, oil, if you... Fast forward two years later, the same month was down 93% uh, exports of U.S. oil, uh, crude oil and uh, petroleum products to China. And for natural gas, according to um, the EIA, they were actually down to zero. So these numbers are quite alarming. Um, but, in, but we have to put the numbers into perspective because, anyway, in terms of volume, uh, they were still very small compared to how much China is importing from various sources. And second, we, we're talking about global markets, fungible markets, so it doesn't matter if the oil from the U.S. is not making it to China, it's going elsewhere. And the same thing one can argue in terms of LNG. Uh, so in terms of volume, I'm not, I, I'm not really too concerned, but in terms of price, here we have much more interesting dynamics. Because if you uh, look at perhaps what was the most 
burning issue discussed whenever people or international agencies were talking about oil market outlook. It was the impact of trade war on oil demand via its, their impact on global economic growth. So if you look at the IMF latest forecast for 2020, they are knocking off almost 1%, or to be precise, 0.8% from global economic growth, and they relate that to the trade wars. So via their impact on global economic growth, uh, we're seeing a weakening in the demand for energy, particularly maybe for oil, and that has dampened prices for oil. Now, of course, that is on the demand side, and remember on the supply side, we have the shale uh, oil or tight oil from the US, from North America, which is having a similar impact. But it's interesting that this is happening at a time where we're seeing record supply disruptions from major oil producing countries around the world, like Venezuela or, or, uh, or Africa. And we're seeing also a very bold move from OPEC Plus and its allies. And we're seeing geopolitical tensions in the region. And yet oil prices are relatively tame to what we were accustomed to maybe 15 years ago or 10 years ago. So for me, this would be be a much more interesting impact, the impact on prices of the trade war than it is on the, the reconfiguration of trade flow. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you, Carol. Um, uh, those are excellent points. Uh, and, and uh, Mike, this is, a, I, th I think, a good uh, starting point for you. Um, you work uh, with Emerson with a range of clients, uh, not just energy. Energy is part of your portfolio, <coughs> but you have a, a, right. a broad view. And, and engage at the most senior levels with, with corporate decision makers. Uh, companies need to make decisions, you know, investment decisions on five and ten year horizons. And can you talk to us about how these tensions and, and these, these price uncertainties and other uncertainties affect their decisions? Yeah, absolutely. You know, the trade tensions are not good for anybody. I agree with you. I hope the ceasefire is next week, right? We're going to sign, you and I, we're going to sign next week. You know, we've had the U.S.-Mexico-Canada NAFTA agreement thrown up into the middle of this. We've had U.S.-China tensions. We've had U.S.-Europe tensions. There have been tensions in all directions. And for companies trying to plan their businesses to uh, consider investments, we've seen a lot of the potential energy investment areas quite, quite stalled out. You know, we had LNG projects in the Gulf Coast of the U.S., other parts of the world trying to understand whether they could move forward or not move forward, if they could trust that their steel price was going to be at a certain level or if it was going to move, if there was going to be a tariff or not a tariff, could they buy modules from different yards around the world. All of that got thrown up into the mix. And, uh, you know, that this period of uncertainty has made it very difficult for, for our, our major companies to move forward with these investments. I'm kind of feeling now, hopefully, that we've got a little more momentum now in the U.S.-Mexico-Canada context with uh, the House <coughs> passing that, and I believe the Senate will pass that handily. And then hopefully U.S.-China phase one, which is at least, you know, let's, let's keep talking now, let's not stop talking, and to see if we can, can work our way forward. You know, the uncertainties have brought a whole economic bias down around the world. We've, mm -hmm. we've seen that everywhere. And I think that's really been the broad impact is really the slower economy, the uh, uncertainty of the, of the energy needs here in the next few years, and then all these projects kind of being disrupted and, and slowed down. So it's, it's, been a, it's been a tough environment. On our side of the equation, of course, we supply to these different countries. We manufacture in these different countries. We, you know, to the extent everybody talks about moving your supply chains, you cannot move your supply chains right. that fast. It right doesn't right. takes years in the global context to get these supply chains set in place. And, you know, at the very little margins, we've been able to do a few things, but, but by and large, we've had to take it and we've had to try to pass it along to our customers and, you know, raise their prices in the process. So it's, it's, a, it's been a very tenuous, I think, situation the last uh, 24 months. Mm, okay, thank you. Um, Anurabha, can I come back to you? Because uh, you talked very eloquently about India and, and uh, its challenges and opportunities. You also have experience in, in global policy uh, uh, rule setting in, in this field. Um, what makes you optimistic in the global setting? Who's working on some of these topics to, uh, to mitigate uh, these impacts? Uh, where do you see uh, public and private sector agents coming together to, uh, uh, to address some of these uncertainties? And what makes you optimistic at night? You assume you am optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> Please say you're optimistic. <laughs> but I am. Uh, I am. Well, look, uh, I think the most important thing we have to first recognize is that, at least from an energy perspective, 
the, 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 the locus is shifting from a sort of transatlantic uh, demand for energy and sort of a, we call the Middle East West Asia because it's west of us rather than the middle of anything. So, it's, um, so the, the West Asia is a supplying kind of uh, uh, fulcrum and then you have Europe, North America demanding to the energy demand growing in, in Asia, in South Asia and in East Asia. So when that happens, you have to rethink global energy governance, uh, which is very directly linked with how trade governance works. Now, the, the, the issue here is we don't need a global energy organization um, to provide um, you know, certainty, stability, etc. But what we do need is voice of the new demanders who are now mo getting more deeply integrated into global energy markets. China has already done that. India is going to be for global energy market trade what Europe was in the uh, last quarter of the 20th century. India will be that in the first half of the 21st century. So the most important player at the margin rather than the biggest consumer demander. When you think of that shift, you think of what is it that we expect from global institutions of different kinds. Uh, number one, we still want assured supply. Right? And we could be India, it could be Indonesia, any emerging market. Now, short supply of what? Of course, you're looking for the, the, the uh, distribution of different sources of supply of, say, crude or gas. But even with an energy transition, you want a short supply of solar panels, of wind turbines, and critical minerals that go into these new technologies. So we need a rule, rules-based order around that. The second thing we need is safe passage. Now again, when we think of it in the sort of trade dimension, we say, okay, sea lanes of communication have to be open, security cooperation between countries, but an energy transition requires safe passage of, say, electricity across borders, not just crude oil on ships. And that requires a very different way, say, if China pushes for an Asian super grid, you're looking at a very different kind of trading system uh, with its own rules embedded in it. Third, you're looking for secure storage. Now, not just caverns in the ground uh, uh, to, to store your oil reserves, but what's going to happen with battery technology that then underlies the way the economy transforms. And finally, you need functional institutions. And it's, what do we mean by functional institutions? For trade or the subset of that energy, you need number one, transparency. And that's what the undermining of global institutions on the trade side is that we don't know exactly who's going to do what next. So you need functional institutions that deliver transparency. You need functional institutions that can deliver on resolving disputes. The, the breakdown of the appellate body in the, in, the, in the WTO is a huge problem, not just for the WTO, but any sense of rules-based order. You, you will need arbitration even for energy-related disputes and so forth. And number three, you need functional institutions that can bring, just as Mike was saying, begin to change that structure of very tightly uh, knit supply chains to new forms of production and consumption in new areas. That means you need technology collaboration. You don't need huge bureaucracies as international organizations. You need facilitative organizations that can bring the private sector um, together to, to invest and develop the next next generation of technologies on the demand or the supply side. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for those comments. Uh, Young Sung, can we come back to you as well? Um, you do a lot of comparative research. Uh, and my question to you that we've talked about before is, uh, can you talk in, in this environment, uh, what are some of the advantages uh, that Korea has relative to regional peers? And uh, what are the, some of the challenges that are unique to Korea that uh, you think the likes of, of, of India and China, for example, deal with a lot less? Uh, I want to give you some example about the solar PV model productions. Uh, I checked the number before I came here. The China is the number one. Uh, they have 67 gigawatt uh, based on the last year for solar PV model productions. The Japan is less than one gigawatt. The main reason is uh, the cost. Uh, the cost is very high. The Korea is the middle of China and Japan. 
So the trade war makes some change, that kind of relation or some. And that means uh, trade war give Korean company like as Hana Kyusel uh, give a chance. That means uh, they increase the uh, number of export of PV uh, module to uh, USA. But um, Hana Kyusel, uh, they try to avoid uh, anti-dumping or countervailing duty tariffs. So they built very big uh, PV model assembling facility in USA last year. The uh, size is 1.7 gigawatt, which is uh, totally same capacity of US uh, facility in 2017. It's a big uh, one. The main reason is they want to avoid to tariff or some uh, dumping. But this is the same to ch uh, China. Uh, even though the uh, USA, they make some tariff or some uh, dumping, those things, but the China, they built another uh, facility into the Southeast Asian country, like as Vietnam or Malaysia. I will give you some specific number. For example, Vietnam case. Uh, used to be their uh, solar PV module production amount is only 300 megawatt in the 2015, five years ago. But that goes up more than 10 times, 4,000 megawatt last year. Malaysia, very similar things. Their uh, solar PV model production amount is only 5,000 megawatt five years ago. That goes up almost two times to 9,000 megawatt last year. So that means uh, trade war changed something like uh, uh, make business or company, they changed their strategies. Go back to Korea case. Uh, South Korea is a very small country, and also we are oriented to uh, export. So pro uh, to solve this kind of uh, uh, trade war, we try to invest lots of money to develop technology. For example, we have very good uh, technology for the battery, for electric vehicles. Samsung, LG, SK, three company has, they have an uh, order from the European country or USA or some other country. They're gonna sell 200 billion US dollar until 2027. It's a huge amount of uh, battery for electric vehicle. But the problem is, the South Korea is a very small country, so domestic market is too small compared to the China and USA or some other country. Second thing is, uh, we have very good technology for the uh, hydrogen car. Hyundai is the number one mover to make a hydrogen car. They built, they make a, a Nexo uh, hydrogen car, the title is Nexo. That was uh, 2017. After that, Japan also made a hydrogen car. Toyota, Honda, they also make a hydrogen car. But one difference between uh, Korean car and Japanese car, Korean, uh, especially the Hyundai, they focusing on the SUV, but Toyota and Honda focus on the passenger car. From the uh, last year, uh, other uh, car company like as Benz, Audi, and BMW and GM, they also make a uh, uh, hydrogen car. But the problem is, um, how can we get a uh, hydrogen? Because we can produce hydrogen using the coal or LNG, but we call that kind of uh, hydrogen coal uh, not green or not even though not blue. So Japan and South Korea, we are interested about uh, how can we uh, produce green hydrogen. Mm -hmm. And also, the South Korea and Japan is very small country, so we are interested about the uh, invest to uh, other country like as Australia or New Zealand, and then we produce green hydrogen and then we try to import those hydrogen to, uh, from their site to Japan or Korea by the ship. So to bring to a uh, ship, uh, we need a uh, ship. So actually the South Korea, we have very good technology to build a uh, ship. But the problem is we losing uh, market power and we losing competition to build Ship. But we can uh, handling that kind of obstacle to make 
floating uh, wind power system. For example, nowadays wind power is we se uh, separate, uh, categorizing only two, onshore or offshore. But nowadays we need uh, detail for the ca uh, category for the uh, wind power, like as uh, fixed, fixed onshore uh, wind power, the other one is floating. Floating means we go further and then the, uh, to build uh, floating wind power, they need something like a technique to build ship. So those are our uh, strategies to uh, handling that kind of trade war. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Um, I want to get back in a minute to, to global supply chains, and, and uh, I know they're hard to break, but it doesn't mean you can't try, mm -hmm. uh, and, and the notion of a significant economic decoupling between China and the U.S., and I'll ask Michael and Carol to, for, to comment on that. Before we do that, Mr. Han, I wanted to get back to um, uh, energy security, energy planning, um, and energy trade are always critical in Chinese policy planning, uh, and you're coming to the end of your 13th five-year plan in which energy, energy trade, energy security, and, uh, and the energy transition were, were key components. Uh, can you tell us about uh, what has been achieved and what you're looking forward to for the next five-year plan in these areas? Mm. When we talk about China's policy, uh, I think uh, before uh, 13, Five years plan starting, China's energy policy have a, a big shift. Uh, uh, this shift, I, I think, uh, the Chinese government take into account of economic environment and the social considerations. Uh, so. Uh, in the five-year plan, the government commitment account air pollution and the local pollution. So the energy policy focus on reduce the curve and promote the clean energy, especially promote the renewable energy development and use. So in the past few, in the past years, maybe four years, in the past four years, China cut off core production capacity. We call the, the over capacity, 800 million tons. Uh, last year and uh, this year, we continue cut off uh, coal uh, capacity. Maybe uh, by the uh, this, uh, end of this year, maybe cut uh, the 1,000 million tons coal capacity. Yeah. I, I think this is a very significant uh, in China and in the world. Uh, uh, another thing is the government can continue promote the clean energy development and use. The government uh, have some uh, details policies required the uh, newly uh, uh, increased the demand uh, we, uh, means new demand uh, should uh, meet by the clean energy, uh, not by the uh, coal and uh, coal generations. Uh, such uh, uh, this is two things. Uh, uh. Another is I, I think the uh, uh, government encourages. Uh, uh, technology development, especially the uh, new technology, uh, new energy technologies, uh, and uh, encourage import clean energy resources, uh, such as LNG and uh, something. Mm -hmm. so, uh, thank, thank you. Uh, 
Mike Carroll, I haven't forgotten about you, and I still want you to answer that question. We do have a question from the audience. So, <laughs> Ma'am, if you wouldn't mind, can we get a microphone uh, this way? And if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself and stating your affiliation. I'm Cornelia Meyer uh, from MRL Corporation. Um, it goes to Mr. Hosh. Um, I have two questions, a very small micro question, but a difficult one. <laughs> um, with the supplies being yanked around, you know, from having Iranian oil and having more US oil and mm. so on. How you do oil doesn't equal oil, and you often find this need specific grades of oil to, to put them through. How do you deal? It's not just the price, it's not just the volume. It's also what quality oil you receive because refiners need to deal with it, one. Secondly, you very aptly talked about the WTO and other multilateral institutions that are broke. What can be done to fix it? Because we do need them, and we certainly need the WTO, a WTO dispute resolution arbitration mechanism. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, two very difficult questions. I know the <laughs> others have to speak. So on, on the grade of oil, yes, I mean, in fact, uh, India has a very large uh, refining industry, um, uh, one of the largest petrochemical complexes in the world. Um, so yes, uh, and the way we have hedged against that in the past is basically you're uh, undertaking these long-term contracts. Um, regardless of the price, so therefore when the price falls, you're, you don't actually benefit so much about, uh, but you guarantee, um, you, you get yourself a guarantee in terms of that oil supply. In terms of the variability uh, with regards to Iran, I mean, the others are just kind of shifting at the margin. So, you know, Iraq um, uh, raced ahead of Saudi Arabia about three or four years ago as becoming the top supplier and the others are moving on the margin. So it's really around Iran. I am not a refinery expert, so I won't be able to tell you whether the presence or the absence of Iranian oil um, makes it difficult for them. But yes, I accept that that's probably a fourth uncertainty uh, in, uh, in addition to the three. On the WTO and, and disputes, particularly on, I would say, monitoring and disputes. Actually, 50% of the WTO's budget went into monitoring. In fact, that was my PhD thesis. Uh, on how do, you, how do you know who's doing what? You know, trust but verify, so verify what? So we can sign all sorts of plurilateral agreements, bilateral agreements, and create a new spaghetti bowl of trade agreements. But even then, it's not the inefficiency of the negotiations, it's the inefficiency of what comes after the negotiations, after the deal. You still need to know what has to be done. And this is not rocket science, you know, Thomas Jefferson, in 1793, released a report. At that time, the United States was a developing country, a very new, nascent, developing country. And it was a report about monitoring what the developed world, which include Britain, Sweden, France, were doing to increase or decrease the prospects for U.S. exports. And that was the first such report that came out of the U.S. government at that time. So the point is, if you don't have transparency and if you're not keeping an eye on the ball, you're not going to do it. And when you take that out of the WTO, when you destroy that institution, then you're, you know, you're, you're on your own. And linked to that is disputes. Now you, I mean, we are humans. We are going to have conflicts with each other. So fine, you can choose not to appoint two new judges to the appellate board. Uh, but you've got to still solve for that dispute somewhere else. So both these functions, transparency and dispute settlement, don't go away. And if you take those away, no matter what kind of deal you sign, it has no credibility. So to me, the answer is, you know, just follow common sense. Okay, well, now that we've cited research by Thomas Jefferson, the bar for remaining speakers has been set quite high. Uh, th this was the highlight of your day. You're welcome. Um, I want to return. A, let me sketch out a, a base case, and you can talk to me about whether that's pessimistic or optimistic. But let's say uh, current tensions continue to, to uh, exist uh, between the U.S. and China, uh, whether there's a ceasefire or not, um, and current policy uh, persists for another half a decade to a decade. Um, and there is a significant economic decoupling between US and China. So uh, Carol, then Mike, uh, 
Carol, perhaps let's start in this region. What are some opportunities that would be created in a world like that? Um, if I look at this region, I, mean, I don't know, it's, what you're drawing is a bit pessimistic, and I, I actually have a more pessimistic scenario. Uh, where do we end? I mean, imagine if more countries, especially this anti-globalization sentiment has been brewing with more nationalistic uh, people emerging and becoming more vocal in the uh, recent years. So what happens if more and more countries retaliate and follow uh, the U.S. and the Chinese footsteps. What happens with the WTO? We're talking about trade disputes is one thing, and they happen often, and they are settled quite often through the WTO. But what about when it becomes a more um, wide-reach uh, trade war that, that is even a more pessimistic scenario? Now, in terms of opportunities, some people argue that if the U.S. is going to lose market share in Asia, that would be an opportunity for the conventional producers, such as here in the Middle East, perhaps Russia, uh, Australia, if it comes in uh, LNG, to expand their market share in the region. Uh, I'm not quite sure that is absolutely um, correct. I mean, there is definitely some element into that. But again, I want to go back to the point I made earlier about uh, the price impact, which is going to affect all producers, exporters, everywhere in the same way. And actually, I think already there is a big chunk of trade happening between this region and, and China. So whatever gains that are going to be made at the expense of the U.S. losing uh, market share is really quite marginal. Um, I wanted to, uh, if I may, elaborate on perhaps a, a silver lining uh, that we are seeing in the market, especially when you are looking at rather I, I'm, I'm a bit careful when I say depressed because oil prices are more or less healthy, perhaps not as mm. strong as they used to be, but they are not really in the 30s or in the 40s. Mm. But still, compared to a few years ago, usually we have a pendulum effect, the relationship between host governments and investors. We often miss on that point when we're talking about the future of investment in the industry. Uh, so what we often see when in current market conditions, we see a global competition for capital between between governments. And uh, we see governments revising their legislation, revising their licensing terms, revising their fiscal terms to make them much more competitive than what they used to have and what their neighbor or elsewhere are doing. We worked on many projects exactly on this, where one country tells us, what can we do to become more competitive than our neighbor and attract more investment in this respect? So the, the silver lining for me here is there are actually perhaps more opportunities for the industry, particularly oil and gas industry around the world, from Latin America, think of Brazil, think of Angola, because yes, some governments are still greedy. I mean, the Brazilians made this uh, mistake in their last licensing round where they hoped they would get the fat mm -hmm. bonus and they refused to re revise their terms, that actually it was only Petrobras, so the government bidding uh, for itself. Uh, and they did not get the outcome. That's why they said we should not behave in the same way that we were behaving perhaps a decade ago because market conditions have changed. Angola has revamped its legislation and fiscal terms. Here in the Middle East, we're seeing places where they were completely perhaps close to investment are more opening to investment in Asia in the same way. So I would say that today the world is much more open to investment than it used to be, despite what you hear about the trade war and the negative stories. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Mike, then, uh, on, on this topic. I, there was one round of escalatory tariffs that the U.S. levied uh, towards China that, in which there was no exemption process. Uh, right. In the prior rounds, there had been an exemption process. If you're a company that's affected by these tariffs, you write a letter to the Commerce Department and they deal with it slowly, but there's an exemption process. And then in one of the latter rounds, there wasn't one. And Ambassador Lighthizer was asked about it, and he said, no, there isn't, because we want American companies to change their supply chains. He was very <laughs> direct and upfront about it. Uh, the companies you work with, who would have opportunities in, in an environment like that? Well, you know, um, I want to take the optimistic view here as we go okay. forward here. I think. We're going to have some trade tensions. We're going to have trade negotiations. It's, we probably do have a couple of years of this sorting itself out. You know, the, the challenge for companies has been the change, the rapid change and not being able to, and I'm hoping that the rapid change phase of this is, is, is passed for us. Um, I agree with you. I think we've seen com competition kick in. I think we've seen tax regimes, mm -hmm. tax rate competition, some other forms of competition kick in. Uh, with the goal of attracting investment, with the goal of these investments moving forward. And uh, 
I think if we can get past some of these rough, rough spots that we've had, I think we're going to see some of that. I also think the populations, the people of the world, are starting to clamor a little bit about, hey, you know, we want our economy, we want our jobs, you know, enough of the, enough of the fight, let's, let's settle this and move along. So I, I'm going to be optimistic as we look forward here in terms of what we've got going on. If we get back to the energy transition piece of this, the energy security piece of this, um, you know, we need these LNG investments, for example, to move forward. You know, we can't have, these projects take so much time to, to come on the stream, you know, they're five, six, seven, eight year kind of projects. We can't afford for them to be stacked up and not moving forward. So we've, we've got to find a way to get enough certainty so we can get enough of these investments uh, to make progress and move forward because of the way, the kind of the, the chunks that that comes in when it comes to the marketplace. Um, so we'll, we'll have to see. Well, you know, we're in an election year in the U.S. I cannot, will not give you any opinion on that. <laughs> I have no opinion on it. I don't know what the heck's going to happen. <laughs> Um, but certainly get a color, I think, a lot of what happens this year uh, in terms of people's feelings about things, people's views of uncertainty. You know, we're, it, it's, I think this next year is going to be a pretty challenging year for everybody. Excellent. We're, we're almost out of time. This is actually a great segue to the next panel, which will be about the 2020 election, and I hope you will uh, join us for that. I, uh, it's great to end on a note of cautious optimism, which I heard from everybody on the podium. Um, I want to thank you for joining, and I would love for you to join me in thanking the panelists. Uh, to introduce Hadley Gamble, who will lead the next panel. Thank you. Please join us. <laughs> <laughs>